Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, welcome to, the, the, to this session. There, there are four speakers. We've got a very good panel to cover many of the areas uh, of science advice and science and policy. I should say a word or two to introduce myself. I'm uh, Frank Kelly. I'm in the maths faculty in Cambridge, uh, but for the purpose, I suppose, of today, I spent three years as chief scientific advisor to the Department for Transport about 10 years ago while Alistair Darling was Secretary of State there. Uh, a, a period in retrospect of uh, long stability in the Department for Transport. Um, and I've been involved with the Center for Science and Policy in Cambridge. So we've got four speakers. I'll introduce them separately. They'll each speak for five minutes. I've asked them to do that and not to use PowerPoint. Following that, I'll open to the floor for discussion. And we'll have until uh, about five, five to five for discussion before Bob Kerslake's talk. So first of all, I'd like to introduce Jill Rutter. Jill is the Program Director for Better Policymaking at the Institute for Government. And before joining the Institute for Government, Jill was Director of Strategy and Sustainable Development at DEFRA. Prior to that, she worked for BP for six years, following a career in, in the Treasury, where she was Press Secretary, Private Secretary to the Chief Secretary and Chancellor, and worked on various areas of tax, finance. She spent two and a half years seconded to the Number 10 Policy Unit, and I have to say, I was fascinated reading her blog, which I'm, I regret to say I hadn't read before. There's a, there's a wonderful discussion of Margaret Thatcher's scientific training and of uh, Thatcher's meeting with Helmut Kohl, uh, where that scientific training gave Margaret Thatcher quite an advantage <laughs> with, a, with a chemistry degree, and uh, ending on the note that uh, now it would be Angela Merkel with the chemistry degree uh, intimidating David Cameron. <laughs> um, there's another item, another book there called Read Before Bernie, which I thought was a wonderful title, as well as an, an interesting read itself. Jill. OK, right. Uh, as Frank said, I'm, uh, I'm the sort of non-scientist among you. Um, I am, however, an alumna of the same old college uh, at Oxford as Margaret Thatcher, which is why we're all sort of particularly interested in her last week. Um, the, the story about Helmut Kohl is actually from William Waldegrave's tribute to Margaret Thatcher in the, uh, in the House of Lords last Tuesday. Uh, the question we've been asked to answer is, from RCTs to making better use of analytical tools to realise the potential of administrative data, dash, can government make better use of scientific methods, question mark. Um, I have to say, the sort of brain that brought you read before burning possibly could have thought of a better title for this session. But anyway, um, I think it's really interesting. I think that this morning, Laura Haynes, uh, among others, particularly quite comprehensively answered some of the can question about this. Uh, in the words of Barack Obama, yes, we can. Um, and there are some examples of government now doing this and more systematically using RCTs. Um, Laura mentioned some of them. There's the work the Education Endowment Foundation is doing, funded by the Department for Education on a long-term basis. And if you haven't looked at something like the EEF toolkit as a very interesting way of bringing data into an accessible form, evidence into an accessible form, then I'd recommend that to you. There was the announcement uh, in March, on 4th of March, by the Cabinet Office of the additional four what work centres to add to the EEF and to NICE. There's the work that Laura mentioned herself, the Behavioural Insight Team. So there clearly is potential for this in government. Um, in 1999, when the Cabinet Office produced its Modernising Government White Paper, no, it was then followed on by a report by the Performance Innovation Unit called Adding It Up, which is about the use of evidence in government. And there, the people writing it wrote, I think they said, 12 chapters, 11 of which were devoted to the supply of evidence. But I think rolling forward to 2013, it's not really supply that is the problem. I think the really interesting question is, yes, you can, but do you want to and will you use evidence and data? And I think it's to that that we need to turn if we're going to look to how do we actually get government to use evidence and data more systematically. The National Audit Office are in the processes of concluding a study on the use of evaluation in government. Um, and I think their tentative conclusions are that it is patchy at best. Some departments use evidence quite well and have quite well-established analytic functions. In others, it's not done at all. And there's another subset of departments where 
it is appears to be done, but actually the way that it's done would make the better value for off, uh, value for money offer not to do it. So I think that's quite an interesting, slightly worrying position. So the NEA are going to produce that report um, when they've uh, worked out uh, their internal lines on it. So that's the situation we're in now. So I think we need to look at why don't we? Why is there not more appetite for evidence and data in government? So I think it'd be quite interesting just to run through some of the barriers. Last year, we ran a series of seminars on evidence and evaluation in policy, and these sorts of barriers on the demand side came out. First, quite a lot of politics and policy is not actually about evidence and data. It's about values. One of the things that, uh, that one of uh, the Conservative advisors said at our event last year is, Ian Duncan Smith believes in marriage. That's quite an interesting proposition. Uh, it depends whether you believe in marriage for its own sake, which is a perfectly legitimate position to hold, or you believe in marriage because it will have various consequences. If you believe in that, then that's a testable proposition that brings you into the realm of evidence, etc. But it's also perfectly legitimate to put yourself out there as a sort of politician you vote for because they have a belief set that actually happens to accord to your belief set. So we shouldn't dismiss that entirely. The second big barrier you hear repeatedly from politicians is just timeliness. Uh, there's a great quote in our work on evidence evaluation and policymaking from a minister with a very strong academic background who says, actually, the mismatch between the timetables for the generation of evidence he would need to make policy and his political career just do not overlap in any sense at all, which I think is quite an interesting thing and thing to need to address. The third one is, even if there is very good evidence, and just go back to the debates last week about closing children's heart centres, whatever, even if evidence, as you would understand it, is really compelling, it may not be compelling to the public, and that may make it very uncompelling to politicians. Uh, remember, we've been in a position where people have been challenged on individual hospital closures in their constituencies uh, when someone's decided to run a single issue campaign. I think that was in Kidderminster. So even where the evidence that you would regard as absolutely overwhelming that you want to concentrate your trauma centres because they have much better outcomes, that case has not been communicated and perhaps cannot be communicated. I think it's really interesting. Um, there's the political inconvenience on another level. We had a great quote in our work on policy making that actually the minister who gets into political problems is the minister who takes the, what uh, Sir Humphrey called brave decision to close a failing programme, not the minister who never bothers to ask whether a programme is actually delivering results or not. It's much harder to go and be accused then of having wasted government money than not asking the question of whether my programme is working. And finally, and I think really quite interestingly, there is quite a reluctance to pilot an experiment. Uh, we had some talk here, and this session is about, can we actually have more experimental government? I think there's a really interesting question about making the case that resonates with the public for being experimented on. We like our politicians. It's very, uh, very uh, useful to reflect on that in a week when we're celebrating the life and death of perhaps our most famous conviction politician. We like our politicians to bring certainty, to pretend they know. Uh, the politician says, I don't know, but this seems like a hypothesis that might be quite interesting to test on some of you. It's perhaps not making the most politically compelling case. So if we're going to change this, then I think we need to treat this in the same way as uh, Claire showed that fantastic systems map on obesity. I think we need some system incentive changes. Uh, quite interesting, the civil service reform plan gives a new incentive to permanent secretary. It says they are responsible for the quality of the evidence base in their departments. Already some signs that might be having some impacts. I mentioned that in my contribution to the report. Parliament needs to be more interested in the evidence that ministers are using to develop policies and select committees, however reluctantly, need to be slightly interested in asking the question on whether policies are delivering the results that ministers, uh, ministers minus one, two administrations said they would. And the PAC needs to be interested in the evidence base for policies and the outcomes of evaluations on a much more systematic basis. Those would increase the incentives on politicians to take this seriously. The media needs to be much more critical of people who do things with a poor evidence base and those who aren't even asking the question of will it work when they set off on something which is a testable hypothesis. There's some evidence that that's changing with the emergence of social media, the emergence of things like full fact, 
much more rapid data checking when ministers use slightly unreliable evidence. You'll have seen over the weekend a spat about some claims Ian Duncan Smith made about the impact of the benefit cap and Jonathan Portes immediately leaping on him and saying, actually, that's not what the DWP analysis of what's changed in the data said. So really quite interesting how that rapid feedback changes, but we need to basically say to ministers there is a political price to be paid for running fast and loose with data and evidence. And finally, we need to change where ministers are with evidence. Um, when we launched our series on evidence evaluation policy making last year, we had as our first keynote speaker, Dr. Rachel Glenister, who is one of the sort of poster girls for the random Easters. She is director of the j -Pal lab uh, poverty lab in, uh, at MIT, and she gave a really, really interesting example of a minister embracing evidence and evaluation, and that was in Mexico, where the minister knew that uh, they were likely to lose an election. He had a program that he thought was really excellent called Progresa, which is a ca conditional ca cash transfer program to poor people. He thought the only way this policy will survive is if I put in extraordinarily robust feedback evaluation mechanisms so that the evidence that it's working is incontrovertible. So I think the challenge out there is how do we move our political system into a position where ministers see evidence and evaluation as their friends rather than as breaks, barriers to what they want to do and potentially sources of bad press and huge political disadvantage. Thank you, Jill. So lots of very interesting questions there, and, the, and, and I expect there'll be discussion later under the general heading of um, where is the demand? What is it that influences the demand for, for, for policy, scientific policy advice? So our next uh, speaker is David Cleveley. Um, David was the founding director of the Centre for Science and Policy in Cambridge, but he's had a career in Cambridge in uh, technology and innovation. He was the founder and former chairman of the Telecoms Consultancy Analysis, this was acquired in, in 2004 by Datatech. In 1998, he co-founded the web-based antibody company Abcam, and he was chairman of Abcam until November 2009. In late 2004, he co-founded the 3G Femto base station three-way networks, which was sold to Avana in April 2007. He's been involved with government in various ways. Uh, he's a member of the uh, Ministry of Defense Board overseeing information systems and services. He was there until 2008. He's, until March 2009, he was a member of the Ofcom Spectrum Advisory Board, and he's been involved in various ways with other bits of government advice. He's been a central figure in the ecosystem of Cambridge, and his experience of business, government, and the university meant we were very fortunate to, that he was willing to, to become the founding director of the Center for Science and Policy, where his uh, drive and entrepreneurial and innovative instincts have, uh, have led its development. So, Dave, very, very good Thank to you, welcome Frank. you Thank you, Frank. I think you spoke for slightly longer than I'm going to, actually. <laughs> um, <laughs> the, um, well, I hope, I, I, the audience probably hopes so. Um, the, uh, yeah, and, and um, thank you for making that phone call, inviting me to become founding director of the Centre for Science and Policy all those years ago. It does seem like a long time. Um, I, I'm going to approach this subject in a, in a rather uh, idiosyncratic way. Um, uh, when I was about, I don't know, early 20s, came out of university, and I was um, working at a thing called the Long Range Studies Division, which was then part of Post Office Telecommunications. And uh, one of the things that was really a big challenge for um, that outfit was the transition from analog to digital switching. And it meant that the whole investment architecture for everything in the UK was going to have to change. So <clears throat> they decided to gather some evidence. And the evidence was going to be done by um, a standard method called the Delphi method, where you go and get a bunch of experts. They give you a load of forecasts. And then you, um, and then you look at those forecasts. You get the average, you deal with the outliers, and then that's clearly what the experts think, and you can base everything on it. Um, so I, I, for some reason, I, I, got, uh, I got pulled into this, and um, I ordered some five-cycle log paper um, because the question on, on the exam sheet was, um, how fast will semiconductors and memory devices change in price over the next few years? Well, five-cycle log paper was just enough to do what I need to do over a, a 10 or 15-year period. 
Um, and the reason why I did it was because I'd actually gone back to the fundamental physics and a book written by a chap called Moore, who everybody now knows as Moore's Law and the doubling every 18 months. And as uh, Nigel Molesworth says, every fool know that. Um, at that time, uh, Moore, Moore's book had only been out for about six weeks or three months, and um, you couldn't even get it in the United Kingdom very easily. <laughs> anyway, so on with this particular b bit of insight, and on with a, a rudimentary knowledge of physics. I'm, I'm an engineer, so I'm not a scientist. Uh, so my knowledge of physics is, by definition, rudimentary, um, <clears throat> as, as Martin has pointed out before. Um, the, uh, um, <laughs> uh, I, I, then, I then drew the graphs of how memory devices would go, and I remember the chap coming up from London to see me. First of all, he, he nearly jumped back through the door when he saw that I was still wearing short trousers. The second thing that he, that he did was um, uh, ask me uh, in an incredulous voice, do you realise that the, um, the forecast that you're making um, indicate that it will be possible to store an entire page of A4, that is something like two kilobytes of information for less than one-tenth of a penny. And I said, yes, that's right. He said, that's incredible. And he said, not only that, but you actually forecast this stuff going on and on and on. OK, um, yes, I said, that's right. So he said, uh, well, as always, you're an outlier. Everybody else is over here. You're somewhere, well, actually through the wall, even on a log scale, I was over on the wall. And, um, <laughs> And the next remark was the one that I think has informed me about the way in which evidence gets incorporated into policy, even in engineering systems. Because uh, he says, uh, well, normally with Delphi, we like you to correct your um, thing and come in line with the experts. And I said, no. And he said, well, then we'd like to ask you, please, to leave the Delphi panel. <laughs> now, um, of course, one has these formative experiences when one's young. For me, that, that indicated that despite, uh, I mean, okay, so I'm a whippersnapper. I, what do I know compared to these experts who, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, have got a great deal more experience than me? But I had actually gone and I had worked the stuff out, which I, I, I have a certain amount of suspicion about going to experts who don't actually then go back to basics, who don't do the fundamental calculations about how these things work. Um, and I have a certain amount of suspicion about going around just asking people's opinions because, really, I like the underlying data. As I said, I'm, I'm an engineer, so I, I tend to think of things um, not, from the, not from the point of view of perhaps a, as a scientist would, but I think of things uh, from a system basis. I, I watch what actually happens. And what actually happens is not what people describe or mythologize. Um, I think one of the, the advantages of getting slightly older is, than 22 years old, is that one appreciates a bit more about sociology and social anthropology and a bit more about psychology and how these things work and how people deny to themselves and to other people in a kind of group speak about what is really going on. In the, in the paper that, that I wrote for this thing, I, I, I talked about, uh, like Democritus, we need to wake up and smell the baking bread. It's a reference to uh, the loss of atomic theory, which occurred sometime for 400 BC or so, 500 BC. Democritus wakes up one morning, smells the baking bread, realizes that actually that the only way that he can smell the bread is that the atoms have come up from the, the bakery uh, down on the shore, and, um, and, and therefore that matter must be composed of atoms. It's a pretty uh, interesting line of argument, which was completely washed away by Aristotle, and so, ended, so began about one and a half thousand years of, of uh, darkness whilst we then tried to rediscover atomic theory and, and the scientific method. Um, I, you know, the, we need to be very wary of all those kinds of things that go on, about the way in which those pressures to do things, not only, not only pol politicians, but also within policy making, and the way in which we talk ourselves into believing something to be true or at least feasible when it really isn't. And there's there a couple of other points that I want to make. One, one is that, that a lot of this stuff is done through networking. And networking is a, like all technologies, all techniques, is a force for good and for evil. Um, you can use it for good, provided the people in the network are good, because you can at least propagate messages and you can get some agreement. But you can also use it um, in the pejorative term, for example, old boy network, for doing something which might not necessarily be in everybody's interest. 
Um, the, the other point that I want to make is that, that a lot of the behavior that we see is, is, about, is about the behavior of networks. It's about the way in which we communicate across things. Now, some things are changing very rapidly at the moment. Um, people like Google or Facebook or Twitter and various other things are changing very substantially. The way in which we think about evidence, the way we communicate about evidence, and the way in which we perceive the world. Now, I'm, again, sufficiently old, in the, old and long in the tooth to believe that actually this, this is going to be double-edged. One of the things about Twitter, for example, is in the first five minutes of something happening, for example, the bombing in Boston, Twitter provides very, very useful evidence about what is going on. After five minutes, it's stopped. The next 12 to 24 hours, all that's happening is stuff is piling up that simply obscures what was really going on, right? So the only good thing about Twitter in gathering evidence is that first five minutes. Now, we are being suffused by all these technologies, all these abilities to do networking, and we need to think very deeply about what is really going on and how we are going to use these things. Because it's, it's, we don't live in a completely transparent world in which one event over this side of the universe is instantly transmitted over there. It gets transmitted through networks, through people, through various media, and we need to understand how that works in order to understand how evidence, data, gets incorporated into, into, into policy. I think those are very big challenges. I think there are very big challenges, and it's a race. Um, one of the things that I'm very keen on with the Center for Science and Policy is we begin a research program properly to investigate this, because I think this is a major issue. How does scientific and engineering advice really get incorporated into policy? What do the the mathematicians and the computer scientists have to say about this, as well as the behavioral, psych behavioral uh, scientists and the psychologists and the economic economists and the social anthropologists. So um, I, I just end, I think, all of that by saying that, you know, based on that one traumatic experience early on, um, I basically, I suppose, taken on this job in order to try and do my level best to do my small bit to try and recover from it. Thank you very much. I think. <laughs> Thanks, David. I expect that I'm hoping that that will prompt some discussion later of uh, the moat in the eye of the scientists, uh, the but also of the uh, the challenges of evidence from networks, challenges from uh, large databases, from Google, the filtering mechanisms by which we see part of it. Right. So our next speaker is uh, Teresa Marto. Teresa is director of the Behaviour and Health Research Unit in the Department of Public Health in the University of Cambridge. So this is a Department of Health-funded policy research unit in behaviour and health. The, Teresa and the unit's focus is upon developing ways of changing behaviour at population levels, drawing on neuroscience, behavioural economics, as well as psychology, her original subject. So, Teresa? Thanks very much. Um, so we're talking about experimental government. I'm thinking this is an experimental panel. Um, so now for approaching the subject at a completely different level to the very broad way in which David has talked about it, and probably fitting well within the framework that Jill laid out in terms of thinking about the supply of evidence uh, as well as the demand. So I just want to make a couple of comments about the supply of evidence because I'm involved on the supply side before thinking about the demand side and how we might know when we've succeeded in shifting what I thought was a, a very neat way of capturing the current situation uh, described by Jeff, uh, Jeff Mulgan in, in his essay about uh, government policy, which is characterized by uh, policy making, characterized by uh, instinct um, and uh, intuition and ideology, that's right, the three I's. And I'm thinking that it's, uh, I think most of us in this room would want to see a government characterized by three E's of evidence, evaluation, and experimentation. So thinking first about how we might bolster up the evidence, and we've heard today about uh, the What Works uh, resource centers, and we've also heard from the Behavioral Insights team um, from, from Laura Haynes' presentation about various experiments. 
at the risk of turning Whitehall into a seaside zoo where we have one of every single animal, and there was a bit of that discussion at the beginning about every uh, tribe, every discipline wanting to be represented, I'm not going to argue for psychologists or behavioral scientists, but I'm going to argue for a skill set that I don't think has been talked about enough, which is the, uh, the evidence experts. And the evidence experts, these are the methodologists, and I think that they are key in two, uh, two components that are, that are core to the evidence base. First of all, uh, generating the, the primary research, designing the evaluation. So we've heard about the RCT as the gold standard. Most often, you can't do an RCT. So it's not feasible. Randomized clinical trial. Uh, oh, sorry, randomized, randomized control trial. Yeah, so experiments where you randomize to one group or another. So most often you can't do that. Um, so we need the methodologists, the experts, the evidence experts to help us think through quasi-randomized designs without using too many technical terms, um, uh, thinking about, say, interrupted time series analysis, AV designs, and so on, because we are so dependent on getting robust evidence. And for those who are involved in looking at evidence, the one thing we don't have much of is robust evidence. And that robust evidence needs to feed into evidence synthesis. And we haven't heard much about that today. And I think that's absolutely core to the enterprise. So evidence synthesis, in brief, brief it tells you what you know already, but you don't know. Okay? So it's out there, but it hasn't been integrated in a way so that you can see what you can see already. Uh, what, what's there. So I just want to uh, give two examples of why evidence synthesis is important and why it's technically very difficult. So just briefly in terms of why it's important, I use an example from the health field of um, uh, from, um, uh, for treatment after a heart attack for blood thinning agents. So the first trial was conducted in late 1950s, involved 23 patients. And it took 33 trials until about the 1980s for the evidence to show a clear benefit of the particular drug. But of those 33 trials, only six had showed statistical significance. And it was only through meta-analysis that it was possible to see that the drug was saving more lives than not treating with the drug. But another 40,000 patients were randomized to trials for another 15 years. Um, before the meta-analysis told the picture. So that's an example of how even asking the experts to scan the evidence, they're not going to see it. So you do need to technically bring this together. Most often, though, we are uh, going to be working in areas where the evidence base is a real old mess. I'll just give you one quick example from, from my own group. We recently looked at the question of, would taxation on food improve diet? OK, so for that question... Um, we, looked, we found 32 studies, 32 studies uh, which were mainly based on model data. They had 132 scenarios and 812 different outcomes. The outcomes were used more than twice on 42 occasions, and none were used more than four times. Okay, so you've got this incredible uh, database. That when the data were synthesized and uh, clustering was taken account of, the majority of the data supported the null hypothesis. Okay, so no, no effect. And yet, people were making policy recommendations based on just a quick look at what the bigger studies seem to be saying. So it's technically fantastically difficult. The skills are relatively rare. Uh, the Cochrane collaboration, the Campbell collaboration, I haven't heard their names mentioned, um, have all the geeks fantastic technical expertise so I very much hope that those involved in the what works work centers will link in with them so I'm not sure they are that makes me a bit nervous mm -hmm. so I think that bringing the evident experts along who don't have content expertise to work with those with content expertise I think will bolster up certainly what can be offered the supply side Coming on to how we know whether or not we've succeeded in moving from a government of three I's to three E's, um, I think, as, as Jill was suggesting at the end, we'll know when we've got there, when the minister comes out and announces a policy and says, well, this is what we're going to do. It's based on the best available evidence and 
all evidence, none of it is certain, but rest assured, uh, in order to ensure that the taxpayer's money, your money, is being used wisely, what we've done is we've implemented a quasi-experimental design, they wouldn't use these words, I'm not a speechwriter for politicians, a quasi-experimental design, time series analysis, and in 12 months' time we will give you the interim results. So I think that that is the end point we're looking for. Uh, quite whether we'll get there, I don't know. Um, because I'm an experimentalist, I think actually this can be subject to experimental inquiry, different ways in which you could present to the general public different ways that politicians could frame their policies. Because I think if it's framed in terms of actually this is about the most efficient use of taxpayers' money, I think the rhetoric in theory could shift. Thank you. Thank you, Teresa. So, so lots to think about there, the three I's and the three E's. I, and I, I guess uh, for the question I want to ask later about of, of a psychologist <coughs> is whether the work in psychology indicates that often instinct and intuition is a sort of quick way to try to do the rational thing when you haven't time to, to think long and hard. The, uh, and whether, whether evidence and, and, it, and experimentation can affect instinct and intuition so that it works better. Mm. Well, mm. our final speaker is uh, Graham Pendlebury, uh, Graham's Director of Local Transport at the Department for Transport. Before that, he was Director of Environment and International, where he had uh, responsibility for a multidisciplinary unit of policy staff, economists, research managers, and engineers. Um, he has served in many posts in the Department for Transport and its predecessors at senior civil service level. Involved, he's been involved with responsibility for tackling the environmental impacts of air transport, and indeed, I first met Graham when, when we were interested in that. Um, when we personally were interested in that. It's been a long-term interest in the Department for Transport. Graham's also held posts in the International Aviation and Rail sections of the Department, and he was Principal Private Secretary to the Minister for Roads and, Tra and Traffic in, in 89-91. Graham's an historian originally. So. I am. Graham, over thank to you. you. So you're not the only one who's the non-scientist, uh, Jill. Well, thank you very much, and, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, the central thesis, I think, of, the, of this session was about the greater use of science and, in particular, experiment in government policy. Uh, and I've heard, actually, a lot about evidence, not, not so much about experiment until, until a little later on in, in, in Teresa's talk. And I mean, but it's hard to disagree with the, the, that central proposition. Uh, you know, human development and uh, the advancement of knowledge comes from trial and, and experiment. Um, and I think there's more experiment um, that goes on in government than many people perhaps appreciate, and maybe some of it is not always uh, that visible. Uh, so, for example, in my little modest policy area in, in my previous job, we had a number of uh, experimental activities. So, for example, we had something called the Plugged In Places program, which was trialling different electric vehicle charging processes in different parts of the of, of the UK. Um, and there's certainly a lot of uh, civic society experimentation that goes on, whether it's local sustainable travel initiatives in my area of responsibility, or in other, in other fields, it might be interventions aimed at young people affected by crime and so forth. So lots of local experiment that goes on. I think often the problem with many of these local experiments is how do you mainstream them afterwards without there just being some open-ended funding agreement, uh, funding commitment, I should say. Um, so experiment, yeah, and it does go on, but experiment at a national government uh, level is more difficult, I think, than it might seem. Uh, and so there are some limitations to its application, and I'll just run through a few of those. And I'm afraid, actually, Jill stole uh, my, my thunder, I suppose, on a couple of these. Uh, and I'll really divide this into, if you like, the practical level uh, as someone kind of working at the coalface who have to deal with these things. Uh, and then also perhaps, you know, if I may, at that slightly more political level, of course, I'm not personally a politician, of course. Um, but at the practical level, first and foremost, you just have to remember that all policies are about people. Um, and it doesn't matter if they're directly about people, such as how much benefit they get paid or how fast they can drive their car or whether we send them overseas aid or whether, it, or, or whether it's indirectly about people, such as whether or not we um, build nuclear power stations or should we introduce carbon trading systems uh, and such like. Ultimately, all policies are about people and how they affect people, what we expect pay people to do, how we expect them to behave, how we expect them to respond. Um, and you should never lose sight of that. 
Um, which leads on to my second point, which is this fundamental issue of consent. Um, we need the consent of the people in a democracy, um, and are they willing to accept experiments, as Jill has referred to, with their health, with the education of their children, with the criminal justice system, with immigration policy, and so forth? So the problem is that they're unlikely to consent to experiments in those areas. Um, they're likely to exper uh, accept experimentation in more, in more non-contentious areas or non-wildly non contentious areas. I may be wrong, but my, my perception is there is a difficulty of consent. There's a third issue, which is also about stakeholder expectations, because one of the things, I know we've discussed this earlier this afternoon in my, in my sort of workshop, the government's has to arbitrate between a plurality of interests. Um, everybody wants evidence-based policy. I've not heard somebody stand up and say, I don't believe in evidence policy. But the trouble is, it's provided that the evi their evidence has primacy over somebody else's evidence, is the way it tends to work. And of course, one person's experiment um, may well be another person's rather divisive and, and dangerous gimmick. So we have to be very, very careful about how we manage stakeholder expectations when it comes to experimenting government. Jill's already referred to the issue of time frames um, uh, and the misalignment between political cycles and the need for decision taking and decisiveness uh, in, in, in the political and public policy arena with the fact that experiments will often take years, maybe even decades, to produce meaningful uh, 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 results. Not always. I mean, sometimes it can be done very quickly, of course, and we should always you know, focus on their areas where we can get quick results. But in many areas, it can take a long time to actually see whether what you're trying out is working. Uh, but governments, obviously, as, as we know, in a modern democracy, work to quite short timescales. And there's another final practical consideration, which I've not heard mentioned anywhere yet, although I, I didn't see all of this morning's uh, presentations, which is that um, whatever is done by national government, and it's true of local government as well, has to have proper statutory authority. Uh, it has to be lawful and legal as well as ethical. And that can be quite a significant barrier to experiment. We can't just go out there and try out things without having some necessary statutory underpinning and the consent of parliament and so forth to it. Again, there may be some exceptions as we see in uh, civic society experimentation, but large scale trials on the public will require statutory approval. At a more political level, um, there are three things, I guess, that I would say. One of my kind of experiences as a, as a fairly uh, long-serving civil servant is that one of the most toxic charges that can get leveled uh, at a government or a minister is this phrase, the postcode lottery, where you've got different outcomes or different levels of resources in different areas. Despite what we say about localism, <laughs> there will be an uproar if one bit of the country is being experimented on in a way that wasn't happening with other. Think about Scotland and the poll tax, for example. Um, so given that different outcomes in different places is what you will tend to get with experiments, that's a bit of a sort of a barrier to the politician who has to defend why he has introduced what might appear to some to be a post-gold lottery. The second issue, and I don't know whether this is a, whether people would agree with me on this, but we seem to live in a country where, which has zero tolerance for honest mistakes or unsuccessful experiments. Uh, sometimes I've, I've read it referred to as the paranoia of the modern state, and we see this more and more, and I've also heard the use of the phrase the inquiry act. You know, as soon as anything goes wrong, there has to be an inquiry and someone has to be blamed and someone's neck has to be on the block. And of course, that breeds defensiveness and unwillingness to try out new ideas, a sort of conservatism with a, with a small c. And then finally, and this is where I, I, I just kind of wonder whether I'm quite in the same place as, as, as Teresa here, um, with her three E's rather than the three I's. Um, if we're not careful, um, policy as experiment and policy that's fully and rigorously based on all the greatest evidence starts to become the triumph of a slightly desiccated, managerialist, technocratic sort of culture. And I think that people uh, expect politics and policy to be underpinned by vision uh, and to some extent by ideology, 
you know, quote Mrs. Thatcher perhaps, not just in the sense of shopping list or very carefully targeted interventions. Now I appreciate, of course, Theresa's working in an area of things like health policy, health interventions, where maybe that's exactly what you do need. But in many areas of policy, uh, vision, ideology, uh, uh, kind of, you know, pace and commitment and enthusiasm, that's what people expect, and I think that's right uh, in a democracy. So yes, of course, to go back to my opening remark, it's very difficult to argue against um, the idea that we must make greater use of, uh, of science and experiment and evidence in government policy. Um, but we have to be, in a sense, realistic about when and how it can be done and make sure we target uh, our, our commitments in those areas to the right, uh, to the right fields of activity. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, many thanks. And I think Graham started the debate there with his answers to, to Jill and Teresa or comments on Jill and Teresa's remarks. But uh, let's open it up more widely now. And so what I'll do is I'll ask. Uh, so first of all, uh, Hayden, do you want to come? Have we a microphone? Um, let's have a look. If, if I could ask you to uh, say who you are and where you're from as, as you start, just that would help. Uh, I'm Peter Sharp from the Royal Statistical Society. Um, oh, right. Hitan Shah from the Royal Statistical Society. Uh, thanks for all those presentations, which is really interesting. One of the things that uh, this government has been really at the forefront of is uh, the open data movement, opening up lots of government data sets. And in this discussion today about evidence, there's not been very much. It's almost been as if evidence happens outside of government and has to come in. In fact, it's almost the other way around. That there's in lots of internal evidence, but how is it used? Just as you've been speaking, funnily enough, Jeff Mulgan's just posted a blog about open data and you know whether it's a damp squib or not. And what he's essentially saying is that, in a sense, it echoes your point about evidence. The supply side is there, but what happens to it is still missing. So I'd be interested in your views on how the open data might uh, agenda might progress into the future. And in particular, what does it mean for the skills we need, the sort of quantitative skills that we might need uh, of civil servants and of the wider population. Okay, so what, what are the, who, would, who would like to pick up Don't on that? You, would you want to do a clutch mm -hmm. of questions? That's a good yeah. idea. So we'll have, uh, so I'll take maybe two or three questions and then ask the panel. So uh, speaker just here. Um, Arnaud Vaganet from the LSE. Um, thank you very much to the panelists. I really enjoyed the, the discussion. I've got one more suggestion. Um, um, I'd like to, to hear your views about it. So among the obstacles to more evidence-based policy. Um, what about the, uh, no, nobody mentioned the, the, the limitations of current methodologies and um, science, the, the, the yeah, methodologies, I would say. Um, uh, Jill, you mentioned the NAO reports on uh, evaluation in government, and it's very striking and interesting to see that uh, the higher the um, research design, so for instance, if you use the, the Maryland um, mm. scale of, of methods, where research methods are ranked from one being very low to high being the gold mm. standard, the <coughs> RCT, the higher, the report shows that the higher the research design, the more difficult it is to, to show that the policy has had an effect. That the, so you see that the, the <laughs> intervention, this, the size of the intervention mm. is negatively correlated to the, the design. So, um, isn't it, <laughs> so, isn't it a bit challenging for politicians and, and for you? And don't you think that this also should be acknowledged? Thank you. Okay. So one, one more. Uh, okay. So the question just here. Just left back. I'm really privileged this time around to those at the front. The back, the back will come later. <laughs> Hi, I'm Tanya Goldhaber from the University of Cambridge. Um, I'm a PhD student. Uh, thank you, first of all, for all of your uh, talks. They're very interesting. Um, I guess I'm curious from the perspective of an early career researcher how we go about bridging some of those issues that happen when you try to incorporate evidence into policy because I think I'm part of that community of uppity young researchers who have all of this somewhat controversial evidence that we want to have introduced into policy. And you've highlighted a lot of real issues around um, what happens there, but how would you go about communicating that in a way that it could have an impact if it's going to be seen as potentially controversial or problematic? Thank you. So what I'll do is I'll ask the speakers to uh, comment on uh, some or all of those questions in the, in the order they spoke earlier on. So Jill, first of all. Okay, well, I'm going to leave the methodologies question to Teresa or David, because uh, that's uh, certainly beyond my, my skill set. I think open data is really interesting, um, because I think one of the things that that does is sort of democratises the process of actually people being able to analyse what government's trying to do and achieve. 
And I think one of the problems has been that we've had this model where things get evaluated when government asks for an evaluation of what it's doing. And one of the things we were very keen was to see other people joining that, because if government selects and is quite selective on what it wants to evaluate, then uh, then it's going to sort of uh, not be as comprehensive. So I think open. So I think it'd be a slow burn. I mean, you know, it may be a damp squib yet, but it may be a sort of huge firework over time. And I think in my thing, I say I think that's one of the most interesting developments in terms of improving uh, improving the sort of evidence and science or whatever. In terms of influencing policy, um, uh, just one thing is. The number of people in government who are sitting reading academic journals behind paywalls is not huge. So <laughs> can I highly recommend David's comments about networking? People need to know about you if they're going to sort of be interested in what you're doing. David? Yeah, I, <clears throat> on the open data one, um, uh, this, this could be um, yet another one of those areas where we've just opened something up that is going to then give quite a significant boost to the economy. Uh, if you think about something like GPS, um, the fact that the American military then decided to have a slightly downgraded version that allowed you then to work out where you are has generated billions, tens of billions, hundreds of billions of, of dollars worth of economic benefit across the world. Um, and I think that the, the similar approach to open data is, is could well bring that kind of that kind of benefit. We have yet to exploit um, huge tranches of, of stuff that, that's owned by government. Um, but here's the here's the catch, which has begun to come out in in, in several of the contributions so far. Um, it, it, it's very it's fine. GPS. I know what the I know what the data is about. I can do my relativistic. Um, um, tweaks and I can get this down to you know narrow point and I can use it in my sat nav. That's uh, a world of difference to something about the evidence from trials um, that, that a government has conducted or you know uh, various bits and pieces like that. But maybe we should have a bit of courage of convictions and think that you know democratic open institutions are rather better than uh, alternatives and that whatever comes with it we, we, we just have to deal with. I think the interpretation, these limitations and methodologies, Anna, that you, you were talking about, then become really, really key. Um, I think it's um, somebody from Google um, get, has got a YouTube video, which if anybody's interested, I'll, I'll, set, I'll give you the reference to, where the, 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 she talks about <laughs> the difficulty of these very big data sets and actually extracting real information from them. Because although you have a lot of information, Actually, there are so many ways to interpret it, you can get it entirely wrong. And she gives some extremely good examples on that. The bridging career researchers, yeah, network, the three things are network, network, and network, I think. Tracy. Um, just to comment on the open data, I absolutely agree with David that uh, actually we don't know how that's going to work out. I mean, there, there were some... Um, experiments, certainly in the health field, where data were released on the performance of um, cardiac surgeons, and uh, Jill, Jill um, I think it was alluded earlier to, to the data from, from Leeds. So it seemed that those data have more impact on the professionals and sort of shapes up the service that they're delivering rather than affecting what people, uh, the punter, is going to choose. Um, because when it comes to uh, choosing hospitals, people are more influenced by car parks than um, actually yeah. clinical yeah. skills. Yeah. Partly because people yeah. think somebody else has taken care of the, yeah, the sort of right. poor quality. So I think it may well influence quality, but not from from the consumer point of view. Yeah, Graham. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, uh, oh, open data. Uh, yes, of course, I, I, I'm in favour of it as well. And it's a bit like these things, like evidence-based mm. policy or science. It's a bit difficult to disagree with it. Um, but I just make one or two observations about it. And the first is I think that, that it can come back to around to issues of consent again. Who actually really <coughs> owns this data? Whose interests are affected by it? Whose identities are disclosed by it? You need to be quite careful about data that the government holds uh, in trust to some degree. And just simply splurging everything out in an undiscriminating way you know, can, 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 can cause you some, some problems. I think the second thing I would say about data is just putting out to the public 
an enormous kind of undifferentiated set of raw data may be quite useful to certain small kind of elite groups in academia or business, but does it really help to improve the policy making process? You know, it's, it, you, you have to think quite carefully about that, which leads me on to my third point, which is about providing data is not a cost-free thing for government. I, I happen to have the, the many of the statistical services mm -hmm. in the Department for Transport working in my bit of the department. And actually, quite a bit of their resource is spent trying to help people to understand and interpret the data that we put out. And certainly, for example, if people are wanting to say, can we run uh, some DFT models putting in our own inputs into there, you have to be able to explain to them how the model works and help them to understand so this is not a sort of a cost-free uh, thing. But, of course, in principle, absolutely right. Um, open data must be there. Uh, this business, I, I thought the question was really uh, from, the, from, the, from the young lady from, from Cambridge there, was partly about communicating evidence to policy, and a lot of that is about networking. It's very important. I mean, my bits of advice would be really, you have to ensure that your ideas and your evidence don't simply segue into kind of lobbying, because one thing that ministers and civil servants are very quick at spotting is when someone's kind of, kind of going a bit beyond their expertise into kind of presenting a particular uh, you know, position. So, so, so uh, do, do be careful that you, know, you, you present this in, a, in an objective way, because we'll spot the spin. Um, and secondly, I think it's always worth scanning your evidence for a, for a few kind of basic tests. Um, is this going to lead to something which increases the regulatory burden? Is it going to add cost to the public purse? Um, is it going to in increase choice for businesses and consumers? You know, there are, to me, there are some basic kind of tests that, unless your your kind of data and your evidence kind of, you know, in some ways, isn't crossing over some sort of lines that make it difficult for government and policymakers to accept, then, then you probably might want to kind of think again or reframe what you're doing. But absolutely, you know, of course, we're very interested. And I think it's very important, particularly that young, younger researchers and the, and the research community does engage more, more with us. Right. I'm going to take um, the, the chairman's prerogative to say a few words now. And I think we'll, we'll wrap up after that. But in the title for this session, uh, there was a better use analysis of administrative data. So I think the open data question does deserve <coughs> a, a little bit more. And I'll say a few words of my own thoughts about this. It seems to me this is an area that over the next 10 or more years is going to have a transformative effect. It's going to generate economic value in all sorts of ways. It's very hard to predict. Now, I'll just describe a couple of examples, one that looks sort of private sector-ish, health-ish, one that looks sort of um, local government. Um, the first one is um, a program that's, gave, that's been run in the US uh, but for tens of thousands of middle managers in a large accountancy company where they're monitored, they're physically monitored, and that's collected and shared amongst them. That sounds horrific. Uh, it's monitored because their iPhone uh, counts the number of steps they take. They want it to be picked up in the evening because it goes into a social network where they can see how many steps they've taken, how much exercise they've done relative to their friends and peers in the organization. And there are various prizes and various uh, mechanisms that make them want to join this. If you want to look it up, it's called Steptacular. Uh, one of the people that helped design it, it was designed in, in Stanford, one of the people that helped design it was Google's former head of games, uh, who has made this pretty addictive. Uh, this data goes in to, to the social network data, and it's extremely easy to run experiments. You can divide the population up into uh, 5,000, 5,000 matched for almost every characteristic you can think of. And you can see whether offering a prize or doing this, that, or the other to one set has a difference in behavior. And the re result of the experiment is, is apparent after a week. You can then refine the experiment, change the parameters, and that allows the system to evolve extremely rapidly. Uh, that seems to me to be an example of something we'll see more and more of. The other, and the other example is uh, Boston's a city which leads the way in engaging its citizens as sensors for its uh, local, local uh, environment. Um, if you uh, download an app as a citizen in Boston onto your iPhone, it will pick up the potholes that you go over. It will also pick up when you drop your phone. It's using the accelerometer to do this. But it filters that data each evening from all of the people that have it. And uh, that's used to prioritize which potholes get fixed the next day. That has an impact on the whole political process there because the, uh, the politicians, rather than being berated for not fixing the potholes, uh, the citizenry can see that there is a way in which they can be engaged in it. Um, 
theirs obviously wasn't the worst pothole in the city. <laughs> There's, of course, issues, and Dave mentioned some of them. In all of these areas, issues concerned with privacy, mm. concerned with ownership, concerned with reciprocity, and concerned with privilege. The potholes are likely to get fixed in the areas that have got more iPhones uh, than, than others. Uh, these are all important issues, but, but you know, we, we, we can deal with them a bit. You, you do know, for example, you can, it's, a, it's a biased socio-demographic sample, but we know how to deal with that over mobile phone uh, data for, for transport. So in all of these areas, I think there's huge, huge possibilities for administrative data and other sorts of data to be used. And I actually think the demand from government for uh, skills will be, will be large. I don't know what the people will be called. Maybe they'll be called data scientists. I'm not quite sure what the right word would be. But I, and I think the demand for them from politicians will grow as those politicians have been elected using these tools in their electoral processes. So my own feeling is that that's an area when, if we have this conference in 10 years' time, quite a lot of the conference will be about uh, the use of that sort of data. Micro-segmentation. Um, I've actually used up all of the time we had uh, <laughs> to begin with. Uh, and so we, we, we'll call this panel to an end now. So I'd like to just thank all of our speakers. So Jill, Teresa, David, Graham, many thanks. Thank you.